Give honor to Brother Lewis, former district superintendent, and I bless all of you in Jesus' name. Y'all notice Luke's sitting five pews back, <laughs> as far away from me as he can get, and still not get in trouble with the Bible school. <laughs> he said, I had all of this I want. <laughs> Well, if you would have sat up front, I'd have given you the $20. You see, you missed the $20. I would have given you that $20 now. But what a great time. We've had an awesome time. It's just been a blessing. Good to see Brother Woodward walk in. I, I bless you, Brother Woodward. appreciate you so very much. Love and appreciate his ministry. How many of you are ready to do a work for the Lord? You want to, God to use you to accomplish his purpose and to fulfill his work and his will in your life. How many of you really want to be used of God? You really want to be chosen by the Lord to fulfill his prophetic word and his purpose for New Brunswick. God, use me. You don't have to set the capacity or what you're going to be used to do at this time, but your willingness and desire to be used needs to be continually expressed every time you walk into his presence. God use me, because you don't know who's going to show up at the church. You don't know what their need's going to be, and you don't even really define how you would be used. But if you're there and you're on point and you're willing, then God can use you and he will receive glory and honor for what he does through you. I want all the glory to belong unto him. All the praise belong unto him for it's for his namesake. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. So I want you to just lift your voice for a moment. I want you to lift your voice in this house. I want you to bless the name of Jesus. I want you to praise him and say, God, use me, Lord. I want to be a vessel of honor that is used magnificently by the hand of the Lord. God, let your hand of anointing come upon me that I might work for your glory and for your namesake. Mark chapter 2 and verse 16, if you would turn and let us read together the word of the Lord, I'd appreciate it. Mark chapter 2 and verse 16. Share with you what the Lord has put on my heart for this morning's session, which is our final session of the conference. And I trust that the prophetic word, that God will wa watch over that word to perform it in each of you who by faith have received it into your spirit. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. And I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Very simply, only the broken are chosen. If you think that you've got to reach a state of perfection before God can use you, you are in trouble because you will never be used. It does not mean that you do not qualify to be used for God. Yes, you do qualify, but you can't wait till all your imperfections are perfected before you step forward and allow God to use you in his purpose. And only the broken are chosen. He didn't come to seek the well. He came to seek the sick. And I need the physician today. I don't know about you, but I've got a fallen nature that I still got to deal with. And I need a savior. And I'm going to tell you something else. I can't save myself. And you can't save me. And the church can't save me. But I know somebody who can and his name is Jesus. And aren't you glad that's sort of in his purpose? You don't have to convince him of that. You just have to acknowledge that in your life. And God's ready to do that. So put your Bibles down, your iPads, your iPhones, your Samsungs, and all of that jazz. <laughs> 
because I want you to reach over to somebody. This is a prayer conference, is it not? I want you to connect with somebody. We're going to come into agreement right now that God's going to use not only you but them and that you will gain an understanding of who God chooses to be in his purpose, that God is choosing you. He's not just simply calling you. He wants to... He wants you to become the chosen. He wants you to be chosen. Thank you, Jesus, for second chances. Thank you, Jesus, for redemption. I will bless the Lord. I will praise his name. I will bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to thank the Bible College for being here. Brother Calhoun, thank you for bringing them in every service. They have added so much to this conference and I appreciate it very much. They've been hungry for the word of God and I appreciate hunger. Anytime I can sense and experience people's hunger, it's so much easier to preach when people want to hear what you got to say. <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't much sense in preaching. Ain't nobody want to listen. And so, but the fact that you had a desire and that you wanted to receive the word of God has just made it a pleasant experience for me and I bless all of you in Jesus' name and I hope that we have said something that you can go home with and God will speak it over and over again to your heart until it is completely and totally fulfilled for his glory and for his name's sake. And how many of you desire that word to be fulfilled, not just hear it, I want to obey it and I want God to fulfill his promise. But you got to walk on to know the Lord. You got to walk into obedience in order to experience the promised word's fulfillment. Because no prophetic word by itself, unattended, will come to pass. It is, does not design to come to pass if you leave it unattended. It must be prayed. As a matter of fact, Paul told Timothy to war with the prophecies that were spoken over him. And there is a warfare that comes along with the prophetic word. And you got to be willing to fight that battle. Because the Pharisees aren't going to take very kindly to you eating with publicans and sinners. And if you do desire to reach out and to do a ministry for the Lord, not everybody's going to be happy about that. And you got to accept that aspect of any kind of ministry that's anointed of the Holy Ghost. Not everybody's going to appreciate it. Not everybody's going to say, boy, job well done. Some people are going to walk out mad. Some people are going to get aggravated. And some people are going to do all kinds of craziness. But that does not change who you are. You're still a child of God. You're still anointed of the Holy Ghost. And you got to understand your mission. And when you understand your mission, step into your destiny and fulfill it to the glory of God and allow God to use you for his kingdom sake. Now, many people come to church, and I know that when we do come to the house of God, I hope that you come for the right reasons. I hope you came today for the right reason. You came to commune with God. You came to be used of the Lord. I want you to gain access to that fellowship with the Almighty. I'm not just interested in experiencing a great event or a great moment. I want a fellowship with God. I don't want God to just move on me with a lightning bolt and hit me and knock me down. I want him to come to the table and I want to sit at the table and I want to talk with him. And I want him to commune with me. I want him to talk to me because I believe that the only way I can regain things that I've lost through life's journey is the hope of fellowshipping with the Almighty. There are things that are poured back into you when you sit at the table with them that you can't find anywhere else. Does anybody desire to recover what you may have lost? I used to have such passion, Brother Kinsey, but I've lost it. God is going to give you a recovery of that passion, and it's going to come back. 
to you. I've had such desire for the things of God, but they've waned because I went through some crises. Uh, but I've come to speak into your life and create a new possibility for a new beginning. And God's going to restore to you what you have lost. Do you know what? You have a right to hunger after God. I authorize you to hunger after God today. You have an authority in the kingdom of God. I'm here to evoke it. If it's not there and you just came hungry for Kentucky Fried Chicken, then I will provoke you beyond that point because I want you to be hungry for God. I don't want you to sit around, oh, I don't want to be used of God and I don't know whether or not it's just my idea, I want you to have such a desire. God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I desire you in my life. Some of you are not sure how you lost the things that you've lost, but you sense the loss and you yearn for restoration. That's what this message is designed to do, to address the reality of the loss. Every one of us have lost things in life, but I speak new hope into existence to reaffirm what you already know. I know that you understand this, but it's a privilege to be able to stand on behalf of God and to speak his word to things that you already know to affirm the truth again in your life so that you say and feel God has just spoken this to my spirit and now he's affirming it. Uh, that's what communion with God is, is all about. Uh, it might be impossible for you. It might feel like I, I can't really break through, but I feel there's a breakthrough for New Brunswick in Jesus' name. You got to get past the coldness of people's hearts uh, and the coldness of people's minds, uh, and you got to step into a new fiery passion for the hunger and the yearning for that communion with him. When I lift my hands, I don't want it to be a response to performance on this platform because praise that's only a reaction to performance is not true praise unto the Lord. I am not here to make anybody feel good that they're preaching. I want to touch God so I stand up and say amen. I say yes. I say that's right because I want to come into agreement with the preacher because that agreement creates a communion and a possibility of fellowship with God. You've got to have that yearning in your spirit. Communion with God becomes impossible when we have an exaggerated sense of self that refuses God's access to our lives. And when we have an exaggerated view of God expecting him to do everything and refusing to allow him to use us in the transaction. Because God's spirit moving on us is not enough. He still needs your human spirit to come into agreement with that. God's not going to override your will. Your will has to be submitted to him. And if you don't submit your will to him, now, I want to correct something because when I said only the broken are chosen, immediately your mind went to the wrong meaning of the word broken. Because the word broken there doesn't mean the hurting. It means something similar to a master trainer who breaks a horse's will to be submitted to the master. I knew you'd be thrilled at that thought. <laughs> God's not going to choose you if he can't break you. And he's going to put you through the grinder. He's going to put you in the crucible. And he's going to find out the stuff you're made out of. Because don't if he can't put the bit in your mouth and ride you smoothly, then he's going to choose somebody else. But I'm going to say, God, I'm not going to. I'm not going to make you put me through 18 different crucibles here. I want to be used of God. I submit, Lord. I submit to what you desire in my life. That's the, that's the key to everything here today. 
I want you to submit to the will of God. And I don't know. I don't design your circumstances. I don't design. I'm not here enough to do that. It's cold enough without me coming up here and messing you up. And I don't ever want to be the crucible. I don't want to be the person that God uses to try you. I don't want to be your crucible. I don't want you to have to get over my bad attitude to get into communion with God. Boy, it sure is quiet now. I don't want you to have to get through my angry spirit or my frustrated spirit in order to get to God. I want to be able to get myself out of the way so that God can flow freely in this place and that anybody who desires communion no matter who walks through the doors of my church, that altar is open and our arms are open to receive them and to bless them with the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Regardless of how many tattoos they have, regardless of how much spiked hair they have, regardless of what lifestyle they say they live, they are welcome in our church. But I gotta get my own aversion to things out of the way and submitted so that grace has free reign in this place to do its work in anybody's life that God so chooses to bless and to heal and to help. Amen. I don't wanna be your crucible, but God does and he does not allow you to choose who's going to train you and teach you. I mean, if you're going to whoop me, God, can I at least teach the person, can I, can I choose the person that you're going to choose to do that? He doesn't give me that permission. I can't choose that person. I don't choose the crucible. I don't choose how God's going to test me. I just don't choose it. He chooses it for me, and then when I'm in it, then I realize, uh-oh, I'm in trouble here. And it's always at the point of my greatest carnality. Always bringing up the flesh and always bring, and then God says, repent. But it's their fault. No, it might be their fault. Offenses will come. But it's your job to react right to it and respond correctly by coming into my presence and communing. Hallelujah. I've got to learn to forgive, Lord. I mean, I've got to actually act like a Christian instead of just claim to be one. I have to actually forgive these people. Yes, you've got to forgive. And when you can learn to forgive and submit to that forgiveness, God will permit you to be a part of the transaction of what he's going to do in your life because now he can minister his grace through you, not just to you, but through you to others. And you can extend your hand out and minister grace to them and bless them in the name of Jesus. And God can trust you with other people's crises because now you're a vessel of honor that allows a free, a free flow of the power of God through you to other people, and it brings glory and honor to his name. We are indeed speech creatures. We live by words, words that are spoken, words that are heard, words that are addressed, words that are answered. Consider Deuteronomy 8 and 3. It says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. It's my job as the preacher to speak words that permit new life and a new communion. Our words can either initiate communion or, or they can cause us to become fearful and shy away. But if these words are bold and they are faithful, they will overcome your exaggerated sense of self. It will override the reductions of our culture that wants to reduce our truth to trivia and wants to say that your truth is just a truth among other truths and that your truth isn't really as powerful as you declare it to be. But I differ with them in this because there can be only one truth. Either it's truth or it's not truth. 
And if it is truth, then we need to believe it. And I've come to give every young person in this place here today a confidence and an assurance that the truth and the gospel is the most powerful force on this earth. And it can liberate anybody from their sin. It liberated you. God's putting up with you. And God has qualified us to be genuinely joyous in our communion genuinely happy to serve the Lord, genuinely blessed to be in his presence, even with the crises, even with all of the people that God chooses to teach me things and train me, I still am authorized to stand up and praise the Lord and bless his name because of all of the goodness that he has done in my life. My task is to share those conversations that I have with God with his people. Somebody's got to say something if you're going to get God's attention because God's not going to pay any attention to you if you can't speak with your mouth. If you can't speak it, uh, then God's not going to pay any attention to you. Just because you're there is not good enough. Somebody got to say something. You say, well, wh where's that in the Bible? Well, the scripture teaches, let the redeemed of the Lord say. Oh, you don't have to say much, just say so. And you got it, <laughs> but you got to say something. You got to learn to repeat the divine words. You got to learn to speak it again and again. That's the first dimension of being a salvation oracle in the presence of God is to articulate your pain, your protest, your need and say, God, the devil is trying to destroy me. Will you avenge me of mine enemy? Lord, that's the first dimension. I've got a need and I'm hungry for a touch from God. Can somebody articulate it today? Are you too sophisticated? Are you too set back by the crisis that you can't say anything? How are you going to witness to anybody if you don't open up your mouth and speak? How are you going to be able to communicate faith if you never are saying anything that has any faith in it? Are you going to be able to declare to people that God's prophetic word is going to come to pass if you don't start speaking it to somebody else? When we voice our hurt and our pain, it evokes a powerful response from God. Let me just read you some Psalms and tell you that, you know, I've heard all of my life we're not supposed to question God, but that's not entirely true. I know what you mean when you say that. You're not supposed to uh, act like God doesn't know what he's doing. But the truth of the matter is, Job asked a lot of questions and God didn't kill him. And he had a very good chance to do it. And if I remember correctly, he asked 75 questions. 75 questions and God didn't blow him up. As a matter of fact, there was no nukes back then at that moment, so there was no nuclear reaction. God just showed up in a whirlwind. And he started firing one question after another. God never answered a single one of his questions. <laughs> Not one. He never, he never answered a question. He just started asking him questions. Where was you, brother? <laughs> when I hung the stars and I created the heavens and the earth and the sons of God shouted for joy, where in the ever-loving was you? I produced all of this and created it. And, and God gave Job a sense of his greatness. And when Job caught a glimpse of his greatness, yes, that God's purpose is beyond my purpose and his thoughts are beyond my thoughts. He said, I am just in, I, 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 I humble myself. I repent in dust and in ashes. I am not worthy to be in your presence. But then God goes on and continues to ask him questions. And then all of a sudden, Job finds the key. These brothers that came around me and tried to try me and mess me up, I got to pray for their deliverance. And if I'll pray for their deliverance, then God will turn my captivity and set me free. So I'm going to bless Brother Brewer for bringing me up into 38 degrees below zero weather. And I'm 
going to pray when I stepped off that plane and my breath was taken away. I haven't breathed since. I hope I can get to back to Florida so I can start breathing again. But I'm going to pray for him that God will be with him and that God will help him. Come on, church. It's time for us to recognize who we are in Jesus Christ. We are bigger than our trials. I said you are bigger than your circumstances. You are bigger than the injuries you take and the injustices you suffer at the hands of others. You are bigger than that. Your God's bigger than that. My God, I feel like preaching now. I said your God's bigger than that. Your God's bigger than your crucible. Your God's bigger than your crisis and your trial. He's bigger. He's going to bring you out. He's going to bring you through because he's bigger. Now here's in Psalms 39 and 2, okay? I said I was going to read the Psalms then I got off sidetracked. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good or bad, my anguish increased. So if you want your anguish to increase, just don't say anything. Just don't say nothing. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm just going to sit here. All right? Your trouble's going to increase. And your anguish is going to increase. But my heart grew hot within me. Woo! I wish some of y'all would do that right now for me. I need that hot heart. (laughs) And as I meditated, I thought on it. I wasn't saying nothing. But the fire burn. Then I spoke with my tongue. And God heard me. Oh Lord have mercy. If some of you would start speaking. When Israel began to speak, although they were burdened with resentment and rage and guilt, and although these burdens had reduced them to silence, the psalmist dares to speak. The preacher steps up and dares to break the silence, to break the guilt complex that weighs like a lead weight around your neck. The speech resumes, and all of a sudden, life springs up, and glory begins to manifest himself because God responds to words. Daniel whenever he prayed and God heard him the first time he prayed and he fasted 21 days he said I was released but I was resisted by the prince of Greece I can't come because of the resistance but he kept on praying and when he finally showed up he said I came for thy words you didn't stop speaking you didn't stop declaring you didn't stop speaking faith and I am come for thy words I'm going to tell you, if you don't say the right thing, God's not going to show up. But if you'll say the right thing, God will show up every time. The word of Israel in Psalms articulated their acute pain. They feel they feel this pain because of the absence of God. The psalmist talks to God like he really matters uh, and God can be addressed. Uh, and the good thing is, is you can talk to him. Consider Psalms 13 and 1 from the director of music, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? These are questions. They're not statements. They got question marks. You say, well, you can't question God. Well, God should have killed David right then, but he didn't. Because it's all right to ask God a question as long as you'll wait around for the answer. As long as you'll let God answer you, you can ask your questions. How long will you forget me forever? You're going to hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? How many of you ever wrestled with your thoughts? How many of you know you lost? (laughs) How many of you ever argued with yourself and lost? Praise God. Lost the argument. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? This is in your Bible and God has allowed it because our heart sometimes becomes overwhelmed. I don't want to question God. 
know I don't want to tell God his business, but there are times that I've got to come before his presence and say, God, how long am I going to be in? When are you going to work and move in my life? When is the enemy going to forever triumph over us? They spoke their rage, their frustration, their resentment. And I know sometimes we're not used to these psalms because we like to sing those other psalms about how good God is. We don't ever quote this stuff. We don't ever speak this stuff because it's almost as if we're embarrassed when we come before the Lord. I don't want to do anything but praise him. But David was the greatest praiser of all and yet he asked these questions. And I'm saying it's all right if you've lost a child, if somebody's turned around and walked away from God that you've loved and poured into. It's all right to come before God and say, when are you going to avenge me? When are you going to bring them back? How long, Lord? It's all right. If this book's true, it's all right. Psalms 39 and 7, but now, Lord, what do I look for? What do I look for? He's asking himself the question now. See, in his presence, you can ask God questions, but you also need to ask yourself questions. Then you need to turn around and answer your own dumb question. (laughs) What do I look for? My hope is in you, Lord. He declares it. He doesn't just leave it with a question mark. He answers his own dumb question. I'm looking. My hope is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. Save me from my transgressions. Don't make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. And I would not open my mouth, for you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. These are honest words before God, and God doesn't reject them. He includes them in his book. He doesn't even refute them, nor does he do one thing to state that they are not adequate or ripe to be spoken to him. I'm so glad. Although there is pain and rage spoken, it is said in such a way that it reveals an assurance, an assurance that somebody's listening to what I have to say. And then in Psalm 6 and 4, turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. No one remembers you when he is dead. Who praises you from the grave? That's another question. If you kill me, who's going to praise you? I want to pray so much that God can't even kill me. He's got to say, man, I got to have that brother down there praising me. (laughs) The brother got to be up in the house praising. I want to be so useful to God that every time I come into commune with him, I don't just come to church to see you. I don't come to church so I can show you what I'm wearing. I come to church to commune with the almighty God. I got some questions I need answered. I'm going to praise you in the grave, Lord. I can't praise you there, but I'm going to praise you down here. And I'm going to give you glory because I still know you're listening. My hope is in you, Lord. I don't ask God questions because I don't know the answers. I ask God's questions. Because I want to reveal the pain of my heart to him and expose it to his grace. Because I know he hears. That's one good thing about it. He hears. He hears. He hears your anguish. He hears the pain of your voice. He understands your hurt. Abraham was the first to dare to speak to God in this way. And when he said, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked question? Abraham asked him a question and God didn't kill him right then. Didn't mess him up. As a matter of fact, God said, be it far from me that I would destroy the righteous with the wicked. He answered his question to Abraham. And then Abraham dares to taunt God just a little bit. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Another question. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right 
I have taken it upon myself to speak unto the Lord, though I am dust and ashes. He recognized that he did not belong in the presence of a holy God. But when he recognized that point, God moved on those two angels to go get Lot and his family out of Sodom. Hey, church, I believe that God's going to restore your families back to him. Some of you have lost family members to all kinds of deception and situations, but I serve a God that is about to come into your life and restore to you the things you have lost because God's going to choose the broken. Those that come before him and say, God, I have nothing to offer you but myself and my brokenness and here I am and I promise you the Lord will not reject you or refuse you. He will be there for you. So I want you, Moses is another example of a, a relentless petitioner who assaults the throne of heaven until God yields to the needs of Israel. He asked the Lord in Numbers eleven eleven. another question. He asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? And what have I done to displease you that you would put the burden of all these reprobates on me? Now that's my translation, praise God. Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their forefathers? Another question. And God doesn't kill him. Where can I get meat for all of these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. Those are the words God was waiting on. Let me tell you something here this morning. The burden is too heavy for you. I'm going to say it again. The burden is too heavy for you. But let me say another thing. It's not too heavy for God Almighty. He can pick you up. He not only can pick up your burden, he can pick you you up with your burden and anything else you're carrying and he said I can carry you in my arms and I will carry you into the promised land all he needs is somebody to say something would somebody say so just say so just say something say something in the presence of the king get into his communion and speak to him the difference between the two masters God and Pharaoh is that God, that with Pharaoh, they had no audience. Nobody could come and speak and say, can you, uh, can you release us from slavery? Can you make our burden just a little bit lighter? There's no audience with, uh, with Pharaoh. But with God, there is an audience. With God, you can gain communion. You can't commune with Pharaoh. He's got too many servants to block the way. That's what the disciples tried to do to blind Bartimaeus. But the Bible says he cried out the more. Why? Because he said, I've got to articulate my need. i got to speak. i got to cry out. The disciples tried to stop the Syrophoenician woman, but they could not because she had a burning desire to be in the presence of Jesus. And although Jesus was dismissive with his terms and his words, it did not detour her from her goal of touching him and receiving from him what she needed. Wow. This thing really does work. Moses petitions he protests the plans of God God responds and God yields to Moses Abraham had new conversations with God that opened new doors of liberating possibilities a, a model is developing that Jesus brings into the New Testament to show us breaking the silence and speaking in spite of your pain and agony and so that's the reason why in the public service I preach because you can't be saved without a preacher. Somebody got to start this process of speaking and breaking the silence. I know that you're hurting. I know you feel disappointment. I know that you feel pain. I can sense it in the spirit. But I can also address these issues. And I can even ask God a question. If you're, not, if you're too afraid to do it because you've been taught not to question God. And I, I know what you mean when you say that you're not trying to tell God he doesn't know what he's doing. 
You're not trying to usurp God's authority and sovereignty in your life. I recognize that and I get, I get that. But the truth of the matter is, the fact is, it's all right to say, God, why did this happen, Lord? I want to submit to your will, but I want to know how long am I going to be in this? God, can you minister to me? And in, in, in Exodus 2 and 23, during that long period, the king of Egypt died and the Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God and God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham. If somebody could just start crying out right now, if somebody could just express your hunger in this house, God would hear you from heaven and he would begin to respond to you because God will remember his covenant. I said God will remember his covenant. You can't silence Bartimaeus. Quit trying to silence people in the church and let them open up their mouth and cry out. I know they're hurting. And if they're hurting, give them an opportunity to express that hurt to God and give God a chance to deliver them. A few years ago, my mother died. She asked me to preach her funeral. About seven months after that, my sister died of liver cancer. She didn't even know she had it at the funeral of mama. Didn't even know that she had cancer, but she had liver cancer, and, and it was too far gone. She died about seven months later. She asked me to preach her funeral, so I preached her funeral. And I was standing at the casket of Janet and Linda, my other sister, about three years older than I am, she came up to the casket. She said, Brian, I want you to preach my funeral. I said, well, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. <laughs> and it wasn't but just a few months after that, she had a large aneurysm in her aorta, and she died. And I had to preach her funeral. And sometimes, when you go through this one thing right after another, the pain is almost greater than you can bear. And everyone here, now you may not have experienced anything like that. You may not have gone through anything. It may even be worse than that. I guarantee if I heard everybody's story here, some of you have gone through something ten times worse than that. And there's pain that's been left in your heart unresolved questions that you have been afraid to ask because you felt like it was a dishonor to God. And I have come to tell you that that is not a dishonor to God when it is a yearning to commune with him. I think you ought to articulate it. That doesn't mean that you go to everybody around you and ask all of these questions to them because they're not God and they can't answer them. Most of the people that try to answer all the questions of why are you going through uh, gets it wrong anyway. They don't have a clue because they hadn't been praying. They've been down at the Krispy Kreme or the Tim Hortons eating donuts. They ain't got a clue about what's going on in your life. <laughs> the last thing I want is somebody that's a pop psychologist trying to tell me what's wrong. When they, don't have, they hadn't prayed, they hadn't fasted, and they have no desire to help me become what God wants me to be. That's why I want to hear a pure word from the Lord preached from this pulpit that's anointed of the Holy Ghost that gives me an opportunity to phrase a whole new possibility of a new beginning that I could come into his presence. But I'm telling you right now in his presence, you can ask him any question you want to ask and my God will not reject you, but he will receive you into his presence. What he's waiting on is somebody who's been saved to stand up and start speaking. Lord, I love you. I know you hear me when I pray, but I want to know how long, how long till you fulfill your word. You cannot silence this. It's an invitation. It's a model to courageous faith, to dare to address God about the pain that's in the world. 
I don't know why people have to die in Paris. I don't know why there's all kinds of terrorist attack here and there. But I do know this. If you'll cry out in pain, God will open up the door for a new life of walking with him. It evokes a powerful response from God. Abraham's first response from God was harsh. For ten righteous persons could not be found in Sodom. But the delayed response was God sent two angels to drag Lot out of Sodom before it was destroyed. Jeremiah assaults the throne with his protest, but God takes Jeremiah's protest very seriously and doesn't dismiss them as being insignificant. He says in Jeremiah 15 and 19, therefore this is what the Lord says, if you'll repent, I'll restore you that you may serve me. If you will utter worthy and not worthless words and be my spokesman, let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. Goodness. I'm going to tell you, that's an answer right there. If you'll repent and say, okay, God, whatever you want me to say, I'll say it. Whatever you want me to speak, I'll speak it. I'm not trying to deny that the pain is there. I'm trying to get you to let it out and be honest about it here today. Quit acting like everything's all right when it's not all right. When you're hurting on the inside and it's all right to hurt, you're not failing God. Go ahead and tell him, Lord, I don't know why but I'm not going to utter worthless words I'm coming before you with praise on my lips I know you're able to answer Jeremiah was not caught in a monologue there was conversation there's another voice there's another presence more powerful than Jeremiah can you sense it in this house? I don't know if you can feel the presence of the Lord like I'm feeling it right now. And I know sometimes I can feel it and I got the anointing all over me, but the anointing's been on you as well as it's been on me. I preach to a lot of congregations around the, the world and some are not anointed. Some are, I'm the only thing that's anointed in the house. But you people are anointed of the Holy Ghost and I'm speaking an anointed word to an anointed people. But I've come to tell you right now that if you will insist on your faith in God and you will insist for an audience and you will come before heaven and even look to the throne of God and say, I'm hurting, Lord, and I don't know why I'm hurting, but I've been through this and that and I don't know why you put me through that, but I'm still your child. I'm still your child. And whether you deliver me or you don't deliver me, I don't care. I'm going to serve you no matter what, but I'm here and where is your presence? Because I'm going to tell you, church, if I can get in his presence, that's my answer. If I I can get into his presence. That's better than any deliverance I can experience from a circumstance. I want to get in his presence. I want that powerful voice. If God speaks in this house, if I hear a word from the Lord, whoo, hallelujah. Job talks to God with an insistent voice of faith and he assaults heaven and he dares to push it just a little bit. And God answers him out of that whirlwind. And Job all of a sudden realizes God's greater than my problem. When I see the greatness of my God, he can handle my, my friends that's just messing me over. He can, he can deal with my crises. He can restore. He restored double everything that he had lost. Oh, I'm speaking a double portion restoration upon this district in Jesus' name. Job raises the issue of injustice. He's crushed by all of the crises in his life. But in a curious manner, God powerfully answers him and declares his greatness and as a result asserts his own sovereignty over all of the earth and over all the heavens. That's why God responded to Israel with an endearment and with a, a love. You've asked me, all, you're hurting, you don't know why. He said, I just want you to know, but you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth and from the farthest corners I called you and I said, you are my servant. I've chosen you and have not rejected you. Some of you have felt rejected by God because of what you've gone through, but I have come to speak this word into your spirit. God has not rejected you. He has chosen you. Brother McCarty, God can trust us with the test. And he is. And then listen to Isaiah 43 and 1. This is what the Lord says.
This is not what Brian says. This is what the Lord says. Who created you, O Jacob? He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Now listen, O Jacob, this is 44 and 1, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. The salvation oracle declares unto you that you have been chosen by the Lord to bear his glory in the earth. And there's no circumstance or situation that could ever arise in your life, no matter how difficult, where there's not opportunity for you to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. Mark of distinction of this salvation oracle is God tells Israel to fear not. And that's what I declare to you. Don't be afraid to express your true feelings in a conversation with God. Go ahead and pour out your hurt and your anxiety and let him see the rawness of your innermost being. He already knows what's there. You might as well go ahead and open up the door so he can do something about it. The third element of the salvation oracle is that God issues a mandate of assurance. He says, do not fear. I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the righteousness of my right hand. Do not be afraid, O worm Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I'll make you a threshing instrument. I'll use you to thresh the mountains. I'll crush everything around you. I'm going to pour water out on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I'm going to pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. I don't know why I feel such an anointing in this place, but I've come to tell you that God's going to bless your children and your children's children and every one of them are coming back to the Lord and you watch for them. They're going to walk through that door when you didn't think they would ever come back and they're going to oh hallelujah they're going to look yearning for communion yearning for a chance to be transformed hallelujah hallelujah oh hallelujah Before you ever ask. He said, I'll answer them before they ever ask. That's what he said in Isaiah. Well, how does that happen? He's asked me to ask. He's told me to speak. And he's already got the answer. He's already prepared the answer. It's not even before you ask. He knows what you need before you ask. But he still commands us to ask. Why? Because there's power in the asking. That while the words are in your mouth. He's already dispatched the angel with the answer. These verses affirm the truth. God's already acted to transform the situation. The word itself makes the presence of God real, powerful, and a guarantee God is going to change everything. Each time God's power is mentioned again, it evokes his sovereignty. He governs in control. He's never out of control of any situation. And nothing that's happened to any of us has ever taken him by surprise. He already knows what he's going to do. He's just waiting on us. I don't want my protest to turn to bitterness. When your questions turn to bitterness, then you've crossed a line that God will not follow. You have to come back from that bitterness. You can't let it make you bitter. I don't know who I'm speaking to. I have no idea what's going on in New Brunswick or what's even happened in your personal walk with God. But I have come to give you a word of assurance that if you'll lay down your bitterness and, and you will evoke that petition unto the Lord that God will not be absent from you forever but his speech and your speech will make his presence possible when you can come in and say without bitterness I will bless the Lord. People can't even worship because of who's sitting in the congregation. That kind of nonsense has got to stop in the United Pentecostal Church because Jesus is bigger than whoever's sitting. I don't care if there are 500 of them. 
David said, if a whole army, if the whole world comes camps against me, I will believe that my God is able to deliver me out of their hand because he understood his greatness. Praise is not approval of what's going on up here. Praise is a yearning for communion with God. It's not your little hand clap that's going to make a difference, but your praise unto a mighty God who created the heavens and the earth can change everything if it's done without bitterness. Hallelujah. When you begin to voice your words, God has moved into action. He reappears. It seems like he's absent. The only reason why it seems like God is absent, even though the Bible says I'm with you always, is because your silence. Your silence creates an absence and a void in your life. That God will not fill until you speak. When you speak to the rock, and when you speak to the heavens, for a long time I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out. Pretty powerful stuff. That's Isaiah 42 and 14. I'm going to lay waste the mountains and the hills and dry up all the vegetation. I'm going to turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. Now, this is God saying, I was silent, but because you spoke, I'm going to speak. And when I speak, I'm going to interrupt some stuff. I'm going to overthrow some stuff. I'm going to conquer some stuff. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory and you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. God who has been silent and absent is going to be urged by our words to return and visit us again. And when he responds to our cry, he's going to manifest his glory. Slavery is going to be overcome. Exiles are going to be ended. And death is going to be defeated. And you are going to walk out of here a victorious individual without God changing one circumstance. If I have to wait for God to change my circumstance before I get this, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I got to wait for God to change the circumstance. But I don't have to wait for his presence if, if I'll start speaking. Out, not out of my bitterness, out of pain, fine, no bitterness. Out of praise, Pain and hunger, God will manifest his glory every single time.
Somebody receive that right now. Somebody receive that in faith right now. I don't know how long you've been silent, but I want you to step out of your silence and out of the comfort zone that you have lived in for some time, harboring your pain, harboring your hurt and your questions, fearing even to articulate one ounce of it. And I want you to stand to your feet and just step forward in the spirit as a step of faith and begin to cry out to the Lord. These words are, are meant for the almighty, not worthless words, not bitter words, but words of God, how long? I need to see you. I need to visit with you. I need to hear your voice. I need to receive you unto myself. Hallelujah.